Hello, Pastor Gavin Whitcomb Sr. here from Moores Mountain Church near Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania. Are you ready to dig into the Word? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you for your truth. We ask for your guidance now as we study it. Help us to rightly divide your word of truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, the, uh, the Christmas season has come to an end, and we're in the new year. And uh, before the, the Advent season, we were studying Ephesians uh, verse by verse. And uh, we were at the tail end of Ephesians chapter 5. And so I'd like to pick up there. Now, we did cover uh, Ephesians chapter 5, but I want to briefly review a few things and then add some things that there just was not time to go over and uh, that I think are really important. So in Ephesians 5, 21, he says, Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Now, what, what he means by submitting yourselves one to another uh, in the fear of God, in the fear of God means because you fear the Lord, you reverence him, you respect him, so this is what he wants you to do. And so as you walk with God and you love and serve and honor him, you do this because this is of him. He says, submitting yourselves one to another. Now, the word submit there, uh, it comes from the Greek word hupotasso. It means, and it's in the middle voice, to willingly place yourself under, uh, to fall in line in rank. It's actually derived from a military term. So what it means to submit to one another is that uh, we are to have um, a humble servant-like spirit towards one another. Okay, so be, be the attitude that we want to be willing to be a servant to those around us, that's a part of it. In fact, in Galatians 5.13, it says, Brethren, you've been called unto liberty, but only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. By love serve one another. So, when, when he says submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God, it means they have a, a humble servant-like spirit towards one another. But it also refers to the fact that we would be uh, submitting to one another in our respective roles. Okay, so, so submission to one person in one role might look different than another person's submission in a different role. So um, Paul here describes how this, this mutual submission would occur between husbands and wives in verses 22 through 33. Then in chapter 6, verses 1 through 4, how does this submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God, how does it work between parents and their children? So he answers that question in chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. And then he talks about what does submitting yourselves one to another, how does that work or how does that function uh, between servants and their masters? So that's in chapter 6, verses 5 through 9. So in our respective roles, we're to submit to one another. Now, um, so when I'm at church, you know, because I'm the pastor, something's going on and I'm there overseeing it. People often ask me, okay, pastor, what do you want to do here? You know, or, or what, what, where should I put this or, you know, so forth. So while we're there, because it's my role to be a, a, a leader and, and a servant of the church as well, um, they would submit to my leadership and my authority. But, you know, this, uh, the week before last, some people in, in our church, myself included, we helped one of our members move. So one of our, our the widows at our church uh, was moving. So um, some people from the church and my wife and, you know, a few others and myself, we helped her move. Well, we weren't at church anymore. Now, this is a different role. So I asked her, where do you want this? <laughs> or, or what do you want me to do with this? You know, it's so see, she, uh, as a church member, she would submit to my leadership uh, in the church. But when I'm helping her move, myself as well as the other church members, we would submit to her 
We'd say, hey, where do you want this? We, and we were there to serve her and to help her. So that's this, this, the mutual submission. But what, it, it depends on what your role is. Now, when it comes to husbands and wives, he says, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Now, I've known people that would read Ephesians 5, where it talks about the man being the leader of the home, the head of the wife, and they would read, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. They would interpret the rest of the chapter in a way that would negate the husband's leadership role, and that's not accurate. It's very clear here that Paul says, hey, wives are submit to their husbands. Uh, the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. So um, it's very clear that the wife is to submit to the husband's leadership role. That, now, this is not a master-slave relationship. It's a loving head of the home, a man that loves his wife, and she responds to his role as the leader in the home. And it doesn't mean he makes all the decisions. Of course you make decisions together, and you try to please one another, but if you can't decide on something, somebody has got to take the lead, and God designated the man to do that, and the wife is to yield to his role as leader. Um, and then, so how does a husband submit to his wife? Well, by loving her uh, and by sacrificially giving of himself for her benefit. And then when it talks about uh, parents and children, children submit to their parents uh, by obeying them. And parents submit to their children by um, not provoking them to anger and by teaching them and helping them and bringing them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. The children need this to turn out right. So the parents submit to their children by uh, teaching them and instructing them and uh, not provoking them to wrath. And then servants, they submit to their masters by obedience. But the masters who are Christians submit to their servants by being reasonable and not being cruel and not being mean and nasty. And uh, so um, that's the way that it works and how it's described here. Now, if you read what the Apostle Paul said in 1 Timothy chapter 2, uh, now, b before we go on to what Paul told Timothy, the, this uh, this obedience and this submission on the part of wives to their husbands and on the part of children to their parents and servants to their masters, um, this has limitations um, because it, he says, do this in the Lord or in the fear of God. So if you have an authority in your life that is telling you to do something that goes against God, well, then you, you, you don't obey that. You, you have to defy that, and you have to obey God rather than man. Acts 5.29, Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. And uh, so God comes first. God never delegates uh, to a lesser authority the authority to tell that authority that you have to disobey God. In other words, God doesn't give that kind of authority. God delegates authority to the state and to um, husbands and to parents and to, you know, to different things. Uh, but God never gives any authority the authority to tell somebody to disobey God. You know, Colossians 2.10 says, Ye are complete in him, him as a reference to Jesus, which is the head of all principality and power. Principality means rule. Power means authority. So all power and all authority, Christ is the head. So we listen to him above anyone else. Now, when it comes to male leadership, that's God's plan. Do you know when God chose a leader for the nation of Israel? He didn't choose a woman. He chose a man. Why? Well, because God intended for men to be the leaders. 
Uh, he also provide. He also intended for us to be providers, you know, workers and protectors. Yeah, have you ever noticed that most men are physically stronger than women? Why? Well, we've been designed to be protectors, and uh, God also designed us to be leaders. And that's, you know, it's my idea, not you know. I mean, it's God's idea, not mine. Notice what Paul told Timothy. Now here, uh, First and tech, Second Timothy and Titus are known as the pastoral epistles. Pastoral means are written to pastors. So Timothy and Titus, those First and Second Timothy, he's giving Timothy instruction because Timothy is a pastor about how to run a church and how things should go. He says in Second Timothy two eleven through through fifteen. Let the women learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not, suffer means allow, I allow not or I suffer not a woman to teach nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. So in other words, um, women were not supposed to be preachers in, in the church, preaching both men and women. Now, why does he say this? He says, for Adam. Now, this is the Apostle Paul. He says it goes back to creation. It's not something that was just unique and a part of their culture in that day and age, but doesn't apply to our day. No, it, it, he goes back to creation. He says this, for Adam was first formed, then Eve. Now, what's his point? Well, what Paul is saying, the Apostle Paul is saying that when God created Adam, created Adam first, he intended for Adam to be the leader. So Adam was first formed and then Eve. Okay, so now that's his point. And that's why he's saying, hey, women shouldn't be preachers. Now, you know, I know there's some churches that have women preachers, and I'm not on a crusade to go out and defrock them or anything. And that's, you know, that's between them and the Lord. Uh, and that's between you and the Lord if you go to a church that has a woman preacher. But I'm just saying that I don't know how anyone can read this passage of Scripture and conclude that that's okay. Now, are there some women that can do a better job at being a pastor than a man? Yes. But that's beside the point. We're not talking about who can do it better. We're talking about God's design. So he says, Adam, you know, I don't allow women to teach or to usurp our authority over the men. For Adam was first formed and then Eve. And he says, and Adam was not deceived, but, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Now, what's the point of that? Well, what he's saying is, okay, we know how the first sin took place in the Garden of Eden, right? You see, Adam was the leader. And, you know, it's not fully explained if Adam was standing right next to Eve when the temptation occurs or what, but, uh, uh, you know, or if it was happening right beside him and, the, you know, the serpent was speaking to her telepathically. I don't know. But, but what we do know is this. See, Eve when it comes to major issues, should have gone to Adam and said, hey, honey, what do you think of this? You know, you're, you're, my, you're the leader here. You're the head. What do you, let me just run this by you. There's a serpent that's, you know, telling me that if I ate of the tree, the one God told us not to, I would be wise. Uh, we would be like gods knowing good and evil. So what do you think about this? Well, see, Eve was deceived. But Adam was not deceived, and, and if she had stayed under the protective covering of her husband and, and sought his counsel as the leader in the head, he would have said, honey, don't listen to that serpent. Don't do what he's suggesting. But by the time she went to Adam with the apple, uh, or the fruit, I don't know what kind it was, but uh, she had already eaten, so Adam saw that. And he was in a difficult position. What does he do? Because he couldn't. He loves God, but he couldn't bear the thought of being separated from the woman he loved. So he ate. So he ate with his eyes wide open. But she was deceived. So now, but he says this: notwithstanding, 
she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. What does that mean, she'll be saved in childbearing? Well, I believe it means this. Even though women are not ordained by God to be the leaders, they are, they are saved from um, a lack of importance and significance and power by rearing children. Because when they rear children, that's a tremendous amount of power because they are shaping and molding human lives. Someone once said it this way, the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. In other words, mothers have an amount of influence that's uh, oh, it's, it's just unimaginable. So she'll be saved from insignificance in childbearing if she continues to live a godly life. So God wants uh, men to be the leaders in the church. That's what Paul told Timothy. Not only that, but in the home. First Timothy 3, 1 through 5, the following verses. If a man desires the office of a bishop, he desires a good work. A bishop then, and a bishop is an overseer of a church, a, I, I believe it's the same thing as a pastor um, or an elder. It's just those terms signify different aspects of the same office. Now, people have different views. I'm just telling you that's my view, and I can prove it from the Bible. So so he says, you know, a uh, bishop has to be blameless, the husband of one wife. And uh, he gives different things. And he says, one that rules well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Now you see here, Paul was saying that a husband is to rule his house, to lead his house, to be in charge. Now it's loving leadership. It's not a dictatorship. It's loving leadership, but he is the leader. And he is to be the leader in the church as well, men. Now that's God's idea that men are to be leaders. That's not mine. Now, I agree with it and I support it because it's biblical. So, um, this this headship of a, of a man in the home, it's ordained by God. Now this, so this godly marriage model that's described here, it's not a master-slave relationship. It describes a leader who loves his wife as Christ loved the church and a wife who is willing to follow her husband's leadership. All right, now, what is the purpose of marriage? Okay, this chapter, the end of this chapter is about marriage. So who is it that invented marriage? God, right? Who is it then that defines marriage? God. And the biblical definition and the historical definition uh, is uh, a man and a woman, right? Who are married to one another. That That's marriage. A man and a woman joined together in a covenant. Uh, uh, a marriage covenant. Okay, so now what is the purpose of marriage? Well, in Scripture we see that marriage has at least five purposes. One is companionship, right? You, to eliminate loneliness. Genesis chapter 2, God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. Uh, help means helper. Meet means suitable to, suitable for, or corresponding to him. So I'm going to make a, a, a helper for him who is suitable for him, fit for him, corresponding to him. Uh, so companionship, to avoid loneliness. Uh, that's one purpose of marriage. And then another purpose would be procreation, right? That's the appropriate forum with which to bring children into the world. God told Adam, Adam and Eve to be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth, to have children. And then uh, sexual fulfillment, to help you live a moral life and avoid fornication. 1 Corinthians 7, 1 through 5, Paul's saying, hey, concerning the things that you wrote to me, it's good for a man not to touch a woman. I mean, that's a reference to marriage. In other words, if someone decides they have the gift of celibacy 
and they would rather not get married and just be free so that they have more freedom to serve God without earthly distractions. He says that's that's good. That's a good thing. But he says, nevertheless, to avoid fornication or sexual sin, let every man have his own wife, let every woman have her own husband. Uh, and he goes on to say that husbands and wives are to render unto one another due benevolence, the things that are a part of marriage physically that you owe to your partner. Your bodies belong to each other, to one another when you're married. Now, what's another purpose of marriage then? Uh, well, I would say it's character development. Uh, in other words, there are things that you learn about living and about love. You learn to think about others. Because when you're married, it's not just about you. It's about your wife or your husband. And, and then it's also about the kids. So instead of just thinking of yourself, you have to think of others. That's good. That, that, that is a good character development. And then married life and family life, it faces different challenges. you got to work those things out. And um, so it is a learning and a growing experience. And then family members can benefit from one another. You know, Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 12, so, um, you know, you, you help one another. You know, my wife helps me. Sometimes she helps me to see things that... I don't notice that are very helpful for me to know. And sometimes I help her to see things that she didn't see or realize. And and we, you know, we both um, together, we improve one another. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 12 says, Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. So in other words, if you have two guys working together, you can accomplish a lot more than just one person by themselves. If they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. So if you you fall down, you can have your buddy help lift you up. But woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not one to help him up again. If two lie together, they have heat. But how can one be warm alone? Now this is, you know, this is an ancient writing more than 2,000 years ago. Uh, in fact, it's more like, more than 2,500 years ago, probably closer to like 2,800 years ago. I'm just estimating roughly. So uh, if you were traveling somewhere and you didn't, it was cold and you didn't have a heat- heater, if you snuggled up to either a friend or a family member uh, together, you could help keep warm, right, if you were sleeping. And uh, so that's his point. Uh, and if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him. So in other words, if you're alone and someone attacks you and they prevail against you, well, if you have two, you could withstand that attacker. Uh, and, and then he says this, a threefold cord is not quickly broken. So there's strength in numbers. So, you know, even with thread, that's just not cords, but thread. You have one piece of thread. You could probably take it and break it. You get two pieces of thread together. It's a little harder to break. You get three pieces of thread. It is not easy to break. So if you have a three-fold cord, it's much harder to break than a single cord. And so there is strength in numbers. And, you know, if you have a husband and you have a wife, that's two, but then the third fold of the cord is the Lord, that is a strong union. And if husbands and wives follow Christ and wrap themselves around the Lord and stay close to him and follow him and are determined to consistently follow and obey God's principles, that threefold cord is not easily broken. Okay, so that's another purpose of marriage. You you grow, you learn to not be as selfish and to think of others because you're in a situation where you have to and you have to be considerate of other people, your your spouse and your children and, and your other family members and their family and their uh, your spouse's, you know, your in-laws and, and so forth. Now there is a, another purpose in marriage, so companionship, 
procreation, physical fulfillment, character development, and then illustration. What do I mean? Well, the marriage relationship is to illustrate the relationship between God and his people, or more specifically, between Christ and the church. He says, For this cause shall man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined to his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Okay, so what's the mystery? Well, it was never revealed in the Old Testament how marriage pictured the relationship between Christ and the church. But a marriage that works the way it's supposed to, it's supposed to mirror that. Because the husband loves his wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. So he gives of himself sacrificially for the good of his wife. And the wife uh, reverences her husband and wants to obey him, follow his, his lead. Now, um, the husband's role is to provide for and to protect and to lead his family. Well, what's the wife's, wife's role? Is her role to submit? No. Her role is to be a helper, a companion and a helper to her husband. Um, submission is her re response to the husband's role. But her role is not to submit. Her role is to be a companion and a helper to her husband. And, and both husband and wife are to teach their children uh, about God and to love the Lord. Now, let me just share with you a few things about happiness in marriage. Now, my wife and I are happily married, and, and I thank the Lord for that. And most people, they would say, hey, do you want to be happy in your marriage? They'd say, yes, I want to be happy in my marriage. Well, I want to just make you aware of something. It is not our spouse's job to make us happy. I mean, it is not my job to make my wife happy. And it is not her job to make me happy. That's my responsibility. My happiness and my joy is my responsibility. And uh, now, you know, husbands and wives should make reasonable efforts to please one another. I mean, he says in 1 Corinthians 7, 32 and 33, He that is unmarried cares for the things that belong to the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But he that is married careth for the things that are of the world, how he may please his wife. Okay, so when you're married, there's a, you know, there's the natural expectation that you should try to please your wife, and uh, wives should try to please their husbands and make reasonable accommodations, but you can't always do that, and uh, so um, our happiness and our joy are to come from our relationship with God. So, so if you say I'm not happy and it's my spouse's fault, now don't don't get me wrong. If you have a spouse that is not acting in a godly way and being very selfish and disruptive to the relationship, uh, yeah, that does make it hard to have joy and it does make it hard to be happy. But, you know, there's some husbands that are good husbands, some wives that are good wives, but yet the person they're married to isn't happy because they're looking to their husband or their wife to make them happy. That is not their job. That's your job, right? That's my job. You know, if you read in Psalm 9 verse 2, he says, I will be glad and rejoice in thee. I will sing praise to thy name, O thou most high. So he's saying to the Lord, Lord, I'm going to rejoice in you. That's where our joy comes from. Psalm 35 9 says, my soul shall be joyful in the Lord. It shall rejoice in his salvation. Philippians 4.4 4 says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Now, there are times when it's appropriate to mourn. I mean, if somebody you love dies, of course you're sad about it, right? There's a time to dance and there's a time to mourn, right? And we are to weep with those who weep. 
but rejoice with those who rejoice. But aside from those times where it's appropriate to mourn, God wants us to be joyful in our salvation. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, right? Uh, 1 John 1, 4 says, These things write we unto you, that your joy might be full. So, um, ladies, if you're looking to your husband to make you happy and the source of your happiness, uh, you're looking in the wrong place. And, uh, you know, by the way, uh, to, to ladies who might be listening, no one man is capable of fulfilling all the emotional desires that you have. Okay, so if you cut yourself off from all friendships, the only the only adult friend you have is your husband, you're going to be let down. You, you can't expect him to completely uh, meet all your, uh, or fulfill all your social desires. So more so than men, women need other godly women um, uh, who are their friends. I'm talking about godly women. Now, I, I would just caution you, don't confuse needs with desires. Um, I, I once read about a guy who was, he was really unfaithful to his wife, cheating on his wife, just a rotten husband. And uh, so he said, well, I can't help it. I just have a need for other women. So that's why he said he cheated on his spouse. I just have a need for other women. No. See, he wanted that. He had a, a, a sinful desire for that, but that's not a need. But he was calling it a need because if you call it a need, oh, I need this. I have a need for this. Uh, then then it, it sort of gives you an excuse to do what you want or to complain if you don't get what you want. So in marriage, if there's something you want, uh, it, it's best to express it with I statements. Like, you know, I would really love it if we spent more time together. Say the wrong, wrong way to do it is with you statements. Like, you never take time out for us. See, that's accusatory. It puts your spouse on the, on the defense. But use an I statement. Like, I, you know, I, see, you are the world's leading authority on how you feel. So say, I um, I, I, I would love it if we could just spend a little more time together. You know, instead of accusing your spouse, use I statements to express what you want. So there are some husbands and wives that are unhappy and discontented in their marriages because they have unrealistic expectations for their spouses. They are, they're expecting so much from their spouse that no one on earth could ever fulfill what they're expecting. I mean, you know, the person that you're married to is not perfect. And you're not perfect either. My wife is not perfect. I'm not either. But you see, if our expectations of, of what we think our spouse ought to be, and they just, reality doesn't measure up to that, if our expectations don't proximate reality, we're going to be continuously frustrated and angry with our spouse. How about a little mercy and grace? How about, now see, before you get married, you need to be picky. If, if you don't like being with the person you're with, then, then break it up and don't get married to them. And if you see some character flaws in them that really bother you, and you don't want to live with that all your wife life, well then break it off. And if the person you're seeing is not a Christian, uh, don't don't uh, yoke up with them. But once you are married, you got to live with your choice and make the best of your choice. I was talking with my hands, and I almost knocked my uh, cup of tea over here. So. Um, so our expectations have to be realistic. So if what you're expecting of your spouse is way up here and reality of what your spouse is really like is right here, see all that distance between what you expect and reality? So if you got that much of a gap, you're going to be totally 
frustrated and angry all the time and discontented. So you might as well lower your expectations and realize, hey, my spouse isn't perfect, but I love them anyway. Do you know, husbands, <clears throat> you got to love your wife as Christ loved the church. One way that Christ loved the church was in spite of our sins. So you got to love your wife in spite of her faults. That doesn't mean you would never challenge her to improve or to change them, but, y y you know, people aren't perfect. And so we have to love and accept our spouse in spite of their faults and their imperfections. And, and you know, we have to accept each other's differences. Sometimes, you know, my wife sees things differently than I do. Uh, and sometimes I see things differently than she does. We don't beat each other over the head because we don't agree with one another. No, you, you accept it. Oh, you're allowed to have a different point of view. And we were, you know, men and women are different. And we, we all come from different backgrounds. And we all have a different lens through which we view the world. So, um, accept each other's differences. Men are a lot different than women. Now, Paul, he uh, summarizes and emphasizes here that husbands, he says, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Now, not one of the deepest needs but one of the deepest emotional desires that men have is to be reverenced or respected by their wives. They want their wives to respect them. And one of the deepest emotional desires that women have is to know that their husbands love them. Now, you know, husbands like to know that their wife loves them, but uh, it's... it's uh, it's more important to most men that they their wives respect them. And uh, to women, yeah, of course they want to be respected, but they, they want to know and want to be reassured that their husband loves them. So there are different ways you can show that love, mainly by your actions, but you can show that and reassure her by your words, by quality time together, uh, by giving gifts, um, uh, by verbally telling her, by physic, uh, physical touch. These are different ways that we can express love. Uh, God can help us to be able to uh, fulfill these principles and to give us happy, blessed, prosperous, thriving marriages. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. May God bless you and keep you and lift up his countenance upon you, and may he give you his peace. Amen.